Beware the man with one gun. I don't know what it is about that saying. Beware the man with one gun. As if some sort of Western post-apocalyptic scenario where you've got the one guy, lone hero, standing on his horse with one gun. Doesn't matter what that gun is, but he's so dangerous that you're threatened. And it's a menacing saying, beware the man with one gun. I kind of feel sorry for that guy because he's probably really freaking boring. Um, the one gun scenario, you know, I guess the thing is about he has one gun, so he really knows how to use it. Um, really, it, 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 this is supposed to be some sort of disparaging remark against people who have lots of guns as if they don't know how to use them. Really, what you're talking about here is a training issue. So that whole one gun thing has always just bothered me, you know, because the man with one gun probably never actually uses it. He probably doesn't shoot more than half a box of rounds a year. Uh, you know, and he probably, you know, he probably doesn't even know how to hold it, uh, know how to clean it, know how to take it apart, disassemble it, and maintain it. You know, there's a lot of things about the guys that I know who only have one gun. Most people I know that only have one gun, there's nothing to be aware of them uh, because they're incompetent. Uh, the man with one gun scenario, that might have been true back in the 1800s where you, you know, were paid maybe, you know, a dollar a week and, you know, you could only have one gun because you could only afford one gun. So use that one gun for everything and you were actually actively using that one gun. Maybe back then, back in the 1800s, maybe that beware the man with one gun thing, maybe that held true. But then again, most everybody only had one gun. So really, it kind of balances out on the spreadsheet. So, you know, I'm kind of sick of hearing about the man with one gun. Um, there's nothing to be aware of. Uh, let's talk about some things. Um, I uh, Last night, I, I, I competed in something. Uh, an IDPA style match and uh, that was uh, held at uh, Point Blank Range in South Charlotte and uh, that just so happens to be where I work but uh, you know I learned some things one okay and I, I, I competed with my 92 FS and uh, this weapon is hot so I won't be manipulating it in any way but when I pulled this out and started running it I actually heard comments behind me, is that a Beretta 92? And another guy was like, who uses 92s anymore? Uh, let's see, U.S. Air Force, U.S. Marines, um, U.S. Army, um, the Navy even has some. But, uh, you know, who, so really who uses Beretta 92s? Well, I guess that would be professional gunslingers. Who are you and what are you using? Anyway, kind of a funny comment. But one thing I noticed about this gun when I was running it, uh, well, it was very controllable. My accuracy was fantastic. My speed was a little slow coming out of the holster. And you probably saw as I was drawn. Um, well, you know, I've got a wrecked shoulder. So getting down into the holster like I used to do, not happening. And I wrecked my shoulder just before our move from Jacksonville uh, out to the Charlotte area. And when I... when. It, I, I don't remember what I was doing, but I remember, ouch, that hurt. I'm going to feel that. My shoulder has not been the same since. So getting out of the holster, I was I was slow. And uh, I'd even say that uh, uh, my speed was, uh, I was not competitive. Because I was, uh, you know, just taking my time. I wanted to do everything safely. I haven't competed in an IDPA style event in a long time. So my focus was on... You know, running the stage, um, doing it safe, safely. Uh, I was more concerned with accuracy than I was with with the overall speed. And granted, I was slow, but I was tactically sound, and I was happy with the way I shot. But uh, anyway, I can't fault the Beretta uh, in any way, shape, or form. The Beretta has been a fantastic shooter. 
And uh, you will notice that uh, I do carry the weapon off safe. So when I go to holster it, I'll flip the lever down and I'll reholster it. And then once it's in the holster, I'll flip it off safe. And uh, that way when it comes out of the holster, I am good to go. Like a Sig Sauer, all I have to do is pull the trigger. So anyway, I'm gonna put this down and keep that in a safe direction. Okay, so um, the other thing I learned was, uh, uh, the main thing I, le I learned about it is, uh, one, I'm slow as molasses in January, but I'm fine with that because when I do get on target, I'm nailing the target exactly where I want to. Um, the other thing I learned really, uh, and the most important thing, is uh, an appreciation for the guys uh, that are running those uh, fiber optic sites. I'm not really a fan of fiber optic sites. Just like, you know, a couple decades ago, I wasn't a fan of tritium. I thought it was gimmicky. Well, with those fiber optic sites, you know, I had a hard time picking up my front sight post uh, at the event and then with the lighting conditions uh, in there. Um, getting that sight picture, uh, that rapid fire sight picture, with uh, just a standard uh, front sight post. And uh, my 92FS, you can see, uh, is running three dot sights with tritium. But that's not your uh, like Trijicon HD tritium. This is like a, uh, a 20 year old tritium. So there's really not a lot of dot going on there. I've realized and I've learned that uh, anything that can make that front sight post pop make it more visible to you, especially when you're shooting quickly, is a distinct advantage. Um, I'm gonna have to find a guy that can uh, put some uh, uh, the Trijicon HDs uh, on my Beretta for me because I've got, I love the gun. I don't wanna get rid of the gun. I don't wanna change the gun very much at all, but I do want a good front side post. So, uh, some Trijicon HDs I think would be great if I can make that happen. But, uh, you know, even if you do everything right, and uh, I like to think that it was, granted, slowly, but I was still doing it correctly. Uh, when it comes to shooting quickly during recoil, even with a soft recoiling gun like a 92FS, um, you know, you've really got to concentrate hard to see that front side post. Uh, so if I had something that could... Uh, uh, brighten that up, I think uh, that would be uh, hugely helpful. Okay, the other thing I realized and, and, and I've relearned was that really it does not matter what gun you shoot. I saw guys there that were shooting guns that uh, some people might consider like less than worthy guns, like say a Smith & Wesson SD9. Uh, you know, maybe that's not the fancy of guns, but uh, they were running at well, and they got a better time than me, a better score than I did. Uh, you know, there's no, uh, you know, what would you call it, a privilege? You know, you're not in a privileged class just because you're shooting maybe what something that may be a, a higher-end gun. Uh, because the higher-end guns, you know, I outshot a guy that had a gun that cost three times is what my Beretta cost. Uh, the only difference was is that, um, you know, I was looking for my front side post and doing a, 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 a controlled trigger pull. So, uh, you know, I shot a lot more accurately than he did. He missed with furious speed with his gun, with his more expensive gun, because he wasn't looking for that front side post or he wasn't uh, manipulating the trigger properly. Hard to say. I wasn't the shooter. That's the thing about IDPA. You're only competing against yourself, and you, while you're your own worst enemy, uh, there's no excuses. There is nothing between you, your weapon, and the target. It's all on you. You can't. You can't. Uh, uh, you, you can't make excuses. Um, so it's uh, uh, you know what you've done wrong. You know, while you're shooting it, you know what you've done wrong. I know what I did wrong. I, I was slow. That's what I did wrong. I took my time. Um, but the results, even though I'm competing against myself, and this is the first time I've, I've done this in a while, so I knew I was going to be slow. You know, I knew that. I took that in stride. 
instead of instead of being as fast as possible, I wanted to be as methodical as possible and, and do it right. So anyway, I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, the other thing I, I, I learned was that it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed being there in that environment. We had over over 30 shooters. I think we had 34 was the count, but on the score sheet there was uh, 33 names. Um, but 33 shooters showed up, and uh, it was uh, it was good to be in that environment. There was uh, shooters of all skill levels there. There were shooters that were, you know, fairly novice. There was there was a guy who uh, was a, a very old gentleman, but you know what? He did it just fine. He had uh, procedural things uh, that counted against him. You know, he was doing things his own way, but he he was doing a good job shooting, uh, and he was having fun. Uh, there was a young kid there, probably uh, 15, maybe 14, I, I'm not sure. But uh, he was enjoying it. And he was there with uh, with his parental figure there. And uh, he was enjoying it. There was uh, lots of high-speed, low-drag kind of guys. Guys that look like they spend their time when they're not shooting matches. They're, you know, bench-pressing Jeeps. You know, you had those kind of guys. You had guys that were, you know kind of more like me, a little bit, uh, uh, you know, out of shape and, you know, over the middle-aged hump and, and they're, uh, you know, they're, they're doing their thing. They're competing. You got uh, all kinds of people there. The only people, though, that did not show up, you know, because there was, you know, different races, minorities, uh, people, you know, from, from all walks of life. And that was great to see. But there was one group um, that was noticeably absent, and that was women. There was no, no female shooters there, and that was disappointing to me uh, because Point Blank Range has a program called Women on Target, which teach women how to go into these events and be competitive. And I know the instructor and her students, and I watched them a little bit, and I know that these gals could have been very competitive in this competition, but they didn't show up. That bothers me uh, because we've seen competitive shooters out there. There's Julie Golob, there's Jesse Duff, and a myriad of others. And we know women can shoot very well, but they're just not really coming out to these events. We need to encourage our wives and our girlfriends to come out and shoot and be competitive. And I've said this before, and this has infuriated a lot of people, but... I'm going to say it again. You are not truly a serious shooter unless you are competing. Because when you compete, you are forcing yourself to be better, to be a better shooter. You are looking for things that is going to make you more accurate, that's going to make you more consistent. And you're striving to improve more so than just going to a range, popping a box of rounds, and then leaving. It's that competitive. You can take training courses all you want. Training courses are great, and I encourage a lot of training. The more training, the better. If you could afford to go to training every month, that would be outstanding. But when you go to a training class, you're learning, and that's great, but you're not applying what you've learned. And if you go to any kind of match, you're taking what you've learned, you're taking it outside of a class situation, away from the instructors, and you're putting that to use. You're competing. And that's a key. Because like I said before, you know, you know what you've done wrong. You're scoring yourself. You are competing only against yourself. The judges, the people taking, taking track, oh yeah, they're timing you. And you know, counting, counting that, calculating that score. But every one of those shots that you break, only you know how you pulled that trigger, and only you know what your sight alignment and sight picture was when that shot broke. Only you know that you had a great sight alignment here, but you jerked the trigger. You hesitated, or you anticipated, or you did something. You know you, what you did. Only you. So when you get into this 
when you get into a competition series like an IDPA type event, yeah, there's a little gamesmanship going on. You know, that's just the way it is. But when you're only competing against yourself, it's you, gun out of the holster, onto target, and you're engaging, and you're seeing your sight picture, and nobody else can see your sight picture but you. Nobody else can feel what your trigger is except for you. So only you can be your, your judge, ultimately. And this is where you know, okay, I know I need to work on my speed. What can I do? Well, I could do some physical therapy on my shoulder to help you know, get my draw out. Uh, the other thing I can do, like I said before, I can uh, do something about my front side post so I can pick up my front side post because, you know, that is a legitimate issue. But, you know, it's something that I have control over. So if I want to improve, I can adjust my optics or I can adjust my gun. I can do one of those. I already got new glasses, got the eyes examined. And like I said, my accuracy was good, but my speed picking up that front side post, maybe I could use a little help on that front side post. Maybe paint it bright out, uh, orange, bright yellow, bright green. Do something so I can pick that front side post up faster. Replace it with <laughs> a fiber optic. Actually, I don't think I ever will. Because as much as I respect the guys, I respect what a fiber optic sight does, I hate a fiber optic sight. I don't like the idea of plastic in my front side post. This is why I replace front side posts on my Glocks to get away from that factory front side post. I want a metal front side post, a solid front side post. A side post that is always going to be there. And I've seen fiber optic sights that have broken and the fiber optic have come out and all they're left, left with is a, uh, a little halo circle of where their bright uh, visible fiber optic should be. So I'm not quite a fan of the fiber optics, but you know the Trijicon HDs, like I said, that would be something that, uh, you know, maybe that would help me. Uh, because only I can see, you know, my front side post. Only I can see my side picture and my side alignment and know what's going on. And if if I can take some time off of refinding where that front side post went after recoil, you know, that's an advantage. Of course, going along with that, let's be honest. If I'm having a hard time picking up my front side post, Maybe it's because it's not where it should be because I didn't have a proper grip on it. Uh, so if I don't have a proper grip on my firearm, you know, the gun comes out of recoil in a slightly different pos position, um, that's a problem. That's something I can work on. And if I'm being honest with myself, I'm going to tell myself, George, you've got some things to work on before that next match. And I'm thinking, absolutely, I do. Absolutely. I know what I need to work on. And that's something, that kind of, you know, honest, you know, true to thyself, we'll say, that true to the self nature of an IDPA match, when you look at that raw score, you can't blame any other person for your position on that roster, because that's just you, your gun, and your target. And that's what you did. You know, you can bitch and moan about maybe, you know, the, the you know, the guy with the timer, you know, didn't warn you or didn't say shooter ready to give you a heads up. You know, you, you, can, you can make excuses, but you know in your heart, you know yourself that all your excuses is just bravado to try to make yourself feel better. If you be honest with yourself, you, you can look at what you've done, procedural errors, you weren't paying attention, or you were thinking about other things and your head wasn't in the game. You were jerking the trigger. And you know if you're jerking the trigger or not. You you can make excuses. You know, I saw a guy, you know, his gun was jamming, you know, every every few rounds, you know, he had a you know, he had to jam. And what did he do? He did his malfunction clearing and he got back on target and he didn't let it bother him. He shot very well. Maybe he could have shot a little faster without the jams, but he still did very well because he maintained his focus and he knew how to run his gun. And that's what it comes down to. Maintaining your focus running your gun. He did it. He outshot me. His gun was jamming and he still outshot me because I was taking my time. I was taking my time as if I had all day long, as if the buzzer was just, hey, why don't we get started here? And I'm thinking, yeah, okay, let's get started. This would be a good time to uh, shoot that first target. Hey, there's another target over here. I think I'm going to go shoot this target here. I wasn't running at speed. I didn't want to at the time. 
So, anyway, let's move on. Uh, there was a question. Uh, we were talking about uh, guns uh, of an economical nature, I'll say. I'm not going to say cheap guns, because a cheap gun would be like a High Point, Jennings, a Lorsen, um, Phoenix Arms. Those are cheap guns. And we're not talking about cheap guns. We're talking about affordable guns. Um, a really good affordable gun would be, um, well, let's go through them. I think I did a, uh, a slight list on my Facebook page. Let me pull this up. This was a short list. And let me scroll down and find it. Oh, look at this. I'm not prepared. And here's a guy that's been doing live radio for six years. Uh, and I'm not prepared. Where is that bloody list? Anyway, let's go from memory. Um, probably the top choice for economic pistols that are still really good is the Smith & Wesson SD9 series. Uh, and I guess they have the SD9VE. Uh, great gun. I mean, this is uh, an evolution of the Smith & Wesson Sigma. And the Sigma has long been known as being Smith & Wesson's copy of Glock. Um, you can look up the history of the Smith & Wesson Sigma. The SD series is a, uh, uh, an evolution of the Sigma series. And they dropped the name Sigma and just dropped it down to SD this for self-defense. It's the Self-Defense 9. Um, really good gun. Really good ergos. Uh, good sights. Um, everything about it is actually really quite fantastic for the money, except for one thing. They have terrible triggers, and I'm a trigger snob. I'm a, you know, I'm, that's always my pet peeve, even on guns such as, you know, the HKs. I wrote a view, uh, a review on a HK, uh, what was it? Uh, was it the P2000? I think it was the HK P2000. And I said that the uh, the gun was perfectly adequate. And I did mention something about the trigger being like a toggle switch. Well, that trigger is actually really good compared to an SD9 trigger. However, you can get a trigger kit from, uh, who was it, Apex, Ajax? Somebody, uh, uh, some A company out there has a trigger kit. And forgive me, it's not on top of my head. Uh, that will greatly improve that SD trigger. Um, I would recommend doing that highly. So get the gun, uh, get some magazines, get a good holster for it, and then when you can, upgrade that trigger. And that will take that carry package from being something that, hey, it's a, it's a good, sound, economical choice to being, hey, this is actually a really good choice. Okay, going good. back to that Ruger uh, 9 Echo, the Ruger 9E, very simplified version of the Ruger SR9 series. And uh, what makes it really good is that well, it's a Ruger. It's got that same frame. It's got the same trigger. Everything about it is the same, except for the slide, which is simplified. Um, very good gun. They feel great in the hand. Uh, I recommend them highly. Uh, you can't go wrong with them. Uh, you do only get one magazine with them, but Ruger mags are plentiful. Any Ruger dealer will be able to get you uh, more of those Ruger, uh, Ruger SR mags. They take the same mags as the SR series, so... It's a great gun. Uh, they're very slim. They fit well in the hand. They've got a very narrow profile. And that narrow profile allows it to you know, carry very well. Um, it allows it to uh, you know, uh, carry close to the body without a lot of added bulk. So that's a, a really good gun to go look for. Um, and there really isn't a gun as slim as that, as a full-size, duty-size type gun that's that slim. Hasn't been one like that since the Browning BDM. So that's uh, uh, definitely a good gun to look for. Okay, the other gun that's a really good value that's worth taking a look at for that economical piece is going to be the Walther PPX. Now the PPX can be perceived as being a gun that's a little bulky and a little odd looking. And to be truthful, it, it really is. It's uh, bulkier than it could be and it's uglier than it could be, but it's a very good gun, it's a very good shooter because of two things. One, it's got a really accurate barrel. It's, that gun is able to print very small groups. Two, you've got a very, very good trigger pull. 
this trigger pull is ridiculous. And for a DAO pistol, which means double action only, um, this is a trigger pull that you wish you had in uh, your Smith & Wesson revolver. I mean, this is a trigger pull that you could happily put in other guns. Uh, and and it's, it's just shocking that it's in this Walter PBX that's, <clears throat> they're going for like $399. Um, and you can get a, a really good deal on them. I've seen them on sale for less uh, in some places. But the, the PPX is definitely one uh, that you need to take a look at. And if you get an opportunity to test fire one, take that opportunity. It's going to shock you. Uh, having never fired one before and having disparaged it a great deal before, after I actually put rounds through it, my tune changed. Uh, it really changed my opinion of it. Um, you know, it's... It's kind of like a, an upgraded high point in its appearance with the big bulky blocky slide. But with that trigger and with the way it actually feels in your hand when you're shooting it, uh, it, it really puts it on the next level. So it's definitely worth it's definitely worth looking at. Okay, that brings me to um, the last of the economic choices uh, that I'm going to talk about. And there's a bunch of others out there. and We, we could go on for an hour on this subject. Uh, the uh, Springfield XD series. They've got a pack called the Essentials Pack. So instead of the regular, like the regular XDs and XDMs that are sold with a holster and, and all this other kit going with it, the Essentials Kit is pretty much just the XD and a spare mag. You don't get all the other goodies with it. It's just very simple. Just the gun, just the mag. And what makes that so good is you're getting... Well, you're, you're getting the core of it. You're getting the gun. You're getting a spare mag. Um, and the mag carriers and the holster that comes with the regular XDs, nobody uses those anyway because they're crap. So why pay for those with the regular kit when you can just get the essentials kit, grab a couple spare mags, because you're going to buy a different mag holder and you're going to buy a different holster anyway. So let's get real. Save your money. Get, get the essentials kit. Now, if Springfield was to do the XDMs in the Essentials kits, that would be fantastic. But ask your dealer for the Essentials. Um, they may not have them. Ask if they can get them. Shop around. Uh, find one because that's going to save you a lot of money. Uh, and you're going to get a great gun. The XD has been with us. Oh, man, when did they first come out? They first came out as the Hot Shot 2000 pistols. And I don't even remember when those came out. They, I mean, they've been with us forever. You know, I think they were designed back in 1911. I don't know, but, you know, it's been around. Uh, it's been proven. The XD guns have been proven many, many times. There's cops that carry them. Uh, there's competitive shooters that carry them. The XD is a great gun. Then the new XDM series is just an evolution of that classic pistol. But, you know, these guns are made in Croatia. They're still being made in Croatia. And the XDM is just a different product line from the same source. Uh, yeah, there's a lot going for the XDMs, and, and I really like the XDMs. But that original XD is still a great gun. And with the Essentials Pack, it is a great value. It's actually putting it back at the original value when uh, the XDs uh, first came out as the XD instead of the uh, HS2000, the Hotshot 2000. Uh, the Hotshot 2000 was like $299 or something like that. Uh, and I think I even remember buying one uh, way back when. But uh, then Springfield took over them, uh, took over the importation, gave it a lifetime warranty, gave it some repackaging, a little cosmetic changes here and there, and rebranded it and uh, you know bumped the price up a couple hundred bucks. But the fact that it now had a lifetime warranty, I think, balanced it off. Uh, so I think that's a great gun. So this is that putting it back at that original price when Springfield just first took over. It's a really great deal. Um, some other guns out there, uh, you know, comments on some other economical guns that you like uh, or that you would recommend. I mean, there's guns out there like the uh, Sky CP, CPX1, CPX2s. There's the um, uh, the CW series cars. There's um, uh, the Bursa, you know, there's the whole line of Bursa firearms, and uh, you may like those. So if, if you like those guns, you know, put it in the comments, uh, comment about it uh, on, the, on the Slide Lock radio page, 
and uh, let's talk about those. So there's a you know a lot of good guns out there, but um, these the SD9, the Ruger 9 Echo, Walther PPX, and the Springfield XD Essentials. Those are my top four picks, and I'm not going to make a fifth. Why bother? Uh, those are pretty much the ones that you know. If I needed a gun at that affordable level, it'd be one of those four I'd buy. And quite frankly, I think out of all of those, you know, I'd probably buy that Ruger. You know, it's kind of a jack of all trades kind of gun. Uh, you know, I've got friends that have bought them. You know, it's a great gun. So out of those, I think the Ruger 9 Echo would be uh, would be my choice. So go to your gun dealer and ask to take a look at uh, a Ruger SR series and uh, see if they have a Ruger 9 Echo to go with it and compare those two guns. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. And now, a note to Ruger, if you could make a 9 Echo Pro, that would be fantastic. One that has uh, removed the safeties, the manual safety, uh, because it's redundant because of the Glock-style trigger safety that you've got. Uh, and also make a compact version of the 9 Echo. I think you would have a very sweet gun. Uh, you'd be selling them faster than you could make them. At least that's my opinion, because I'm a fan. Love you, Ruger. Didn't used to, be honest. Didn't used to like Rugers. Uh, but uh, Rugers come a long way, and uh, I can't deny it. They're doing a great job. They're making a fine fine weapon, and uh, you know, you got to be honest enough with yourself to, to, to say that. Uh, so, yeah, they've changed my opinion. It's not the first time that's happened. So uh, uh, when it does happen, I'll be honest uh, and, and say it. Hey, my opinion's changed. So, anyway. You've got my opinions, and hopefully it's uh, uh, what uh, it's worth what you paid for.